So thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Silard, and uh, I have a slide a little bit more about myself. So many, many years ago, almost in a previous life, I was doing physics. That was uh, 20 plus years ago. And uh, like most of my colleagues, I moved to finance. And then uh, I'm originally from Europe, but 12 years ago, I moved to California to do what later has been called ever since uh, data science. Uh, I'm also a meetup organizer. Uh, I've been teaching at two universities, and I have some machine learning benchmarks that are on GitHub, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those as well in this talk. And quick disclaimer, everything I say here is especially everything bad and nasty is uh, my own responsibility, so don't blame my employer. They are really nice people. So <laughs> probably many of you have seen, how many of you have seen the slide? All right, so at least half. So this is uh, from uh, Andrew Ang. He's a great guy. He's founder of Coursera. He's been teaching machine learning for ages at Stanford. So he really knows uh, what he's doing. He's a little bit hyping deep learning lately. So this is a slide from maybe three, four years ago where he claims that deep learning is better than any other machine learning algorithm, uh, especially if you have uh, a lot of data. And uh, we expect deep learning to give us self-driving cars, and the claim is also that deep learning is already smarter than humans since it beats human players and many, many games. And of course, we expect to have an eminent uh, AI and whatever that will bring to us. So I think these claims are a little bit overblown. So the reality is more nuanced. So indeed, deep learning uh, has been uh, very successful in uh, computer vision, uh, in image classification. Uh, it has some success uh, with sequence prediction, time series, text, and combined with reinforcement learning. Uh, indeed, it has been very successful in many virtual environment, uh, like games where you can create as much data by playing the computers against each other, uh, as much data as you want. And in that case, deep learning can indeed uh, uh, have uh, uh, very successful results. However, in real life, I'm not sure uh, deep learning will really give us AI or if it will be very successful in uh, most big business applications. And in fact, we've been having machine learning for at least 30 years and very successful analytics applications in many, many domains. In many, many domains. For example, in fraud detection or credit scoring or marketing analytics, people have been doing machine learning in those domains uh, for 20, 30 years. Uh, or many, many other domains, like manufacturing, for, uh, uh, for example, um, fraud detection, uh, insurance, telecom. You guys, if you work in businesses, you, you already know this. So I try in a little GitHub repo on some public data to see if deep learning in some of these domains gives better results. And uh, I've been trying many, many architectures and tuning and talk to uh, top world experts in deep learning. And in many cases, I couldn't make as good results as with other traditional algorithms. And this was a couple of years ago. I think a better, even better proof of this is uh, this talk by Tianqi Chen. He's a um, uh, world top researcher, both in traditional machine learning algorithms and also in deep learning. And he had a talk at my meetup in Los Angeles where 
uh, in 2016, he was saying that two thirds of Kaggle competitions where people really compete on accuracy uh, and people invest a lot of time in uh, finding the best solution to a problem. In two thirds of the cases, the winning algorithm was not deep learning, was gradient boosting. And in about one third of cases, it was uh, deep learning. So the pattern here is uh, a little bit oversimplified is like if you have some kind of business traditional business problem with tabular data, then typically gradient boosting beats deep learning. If you have uh, uh, image or, or speech or text data, then typically deep learning is, is best. So here's kind of my answer to Andrew Yang's slide. So I think in most uh, applications in businesses where you have uh, uh, tabular data. Uh, typically, this data comes from relational databases. And uh, the typical problem is like fraud prediction or customer churn or any of those kind of traditional business applications. Deep learning is not really the best. Therefore, it's my thought of this talk. But for those of us doing machine learning for a decade or more, uh, this is not really uh, new and it's not really surprising. So here are two papers from 2006, ICML, uh, by overlapping authors that I like. I've been quoting this for the last five years. I, don't, I think they are still not outdated. So these guys have taken 20-plus uh, data sets, 10 plus algorithms, various metrics, and have done a huge comparison of the accuracy of different uh, algorithms. And they came out that the top ones were like random forest, uh, boosting neural networks, which now deep learning if you want, support vector machines, and then logistic regression. But like boosting a random forest came up the top, and uh, this was a little bit smaller data sets that nowadays on Kaggle. So I think the typical size was maybe 10,000 records. Typical Kaggle sizes and business applications are like 100,000 records, a million records. And in this case, boosting becomes uh, better than random forest in general. Uh, but when you want to do, uh, you go for the accuracy in a machine learning project, it's not only the algorithm that matters. Actually, several other things matter even more. Uh, one of the most important things is to clean your data and understand your data and uh, the domain knowledge. Use it for building features. And uh, you, can even Im you can improve even more the accuracy if you ensemble many, many models. So those are all important, and especially the cleaning data and the uh, feature extraction or feature engineering is sometimes more often more important than which algorithm you use, whether it's random forest, boosting, or neural nets. And ultimately, this whole process of this used to be called data mining. And this is just my picture inspired from what's called CRIFS, which came from the 1990s, this document put together by industry experts of what we are doing in a data mining, now call it data science, machine learning projects. So basically, we collect some data, we explore, visualize, clean the data, and then we do the modeling, validate the models, and, and then deploy them. And we try also to understand what's going on in a problem or in the data. So this is all important, at least as important as if more important than, than which algorithm you choose. So the algorithm you choose is just the modeling part. It's a small piece. So if I want to kind of summarize what I want to say in this talk uh, and put it in very simple terms, I think if you have typical business problem, problem with structured uh, tabular data coming from relational databases, then uh, I would try first gradient boosting or random forest. So any of these algorithms, which are ensembles of trees. If you have small data 
couple of hundred, maybe a thousand observations, then everything else, then probably some very simple linear models will overfit. So you don't do any good by using something very sophisticated. So go for the simple linear models. If you have big data or, or fast data, then again, gradient boosting random forest, even neural networks will be computationally infeasible. You would need to wait to train them for hours or days or even more. So uh, you want to uh, use, again, linear models typically solved with not even solving the matrix algebra part, but just doing stochastic gradient descent. Um, and if you have image, uh, speech, or even text, then indeed uh, do deep learning. So you can see that the title of this talk was kind of misguided and just to make you come here to listen to my talk. But indeed, so gradient boosting is not better than deep learning. Or neither is deep learning better than gradient boosting. So each of these are methods, tools that are good as something and they are bad as something else. So in a typical business application with structured tabular data, you would want to go first and use gradient boosting because that's going to beat in accuracy deep learning. But with like images, speech, and many other problems, deep learning is the best. So use it. So it depends on, on the problem you have to work on. So indeed, it depends. Uh, another way is to try them all. So. There are maybe like four algorithms you, if you do supervised learning, trying to predict an outcome from inputs, then uh, there are maybe four or five algorithms you need to care the most, so you can try them all. Uh, you can also play with hyperparameter tuning. Uh, many of those algorithms have a lot of parameters. You can try to tune them to get better accuracy. Uh, I mentioned already ensembles do many models and uh, ensemble them. A simple way to ensemble them is to take an average, but there are more sophisticated ways. Uh, feature engineering, I uh, mentioned it again, it's very important. So the deep learning people will tell you that deep learning is replacing feature engineering and you don't need to do feature engineering, which is true for images and in some other domains. But again, in these business applications, it typically deep learning doesn't figure out domain knowledge. So you still want and have to do feature engineering if you want to get good results and data cleaning, obviously. And sometimes you don't, sometimes accuracy is not really the most important thing you go after in a project. So if you have to explain your model, uh, because of regulations or some other reasons, or you want to understand your model, then, then you might not even want to use gradient boosting or deep learning. You might want to use something more explainable, like additive models or even, God forbid, uh, linear regression. So with all these disclaimers that the algorithm, not only the algorithm is important, but many other things, and Gradient boosting is not better than deep learning. But so um, let's say you want to hear a little bit more about gradient boosting. So this is going to be the rest of this talk. So the gradient boosting is based on trees. You build decision trees, and then you ensemble, you average them. Um, so what's a decision tree? Decision tree, you can think of it as a recursive partitioning of the input space, and then you assign the labels. Uh, you can, uh, so basically from the data, you build this structure where the whole structure is learned from the data and also like this, which variables are in the splits and what are the split points. You also, it comes from the data with a base decision tree uh, learning algorithm. So the outcome, is something like this. This is an example from my favorite book 
I'm gonna talk a little bit later. Uh, so this is like a spam detection problem, and basically here was that uh, the email is spam or not. And this is from the 90s when the spam emails had a lot of dollar signs in the <laughs> in the con in the text. So basically, if the percentage of dollar signs was like greater than five percent, then you would go in this direction. And basically, the leaves of the trees. So basically, to read a decision tree, you, you have an input, uh, and then you go over the splits, and then you end up in a leaf, and then the leaf will tell you if it's, uh, in case of binary classification, if it's 0, 1, or in case of regression, uh, a number. So the first boosting algorithm comes, not gradient boosting, but adder boost comes uh, from 1997. And the idea here is, uh, uh, you don't need to read this, I just put it for reference. So you build decision trees, and you're going to average them. And the way you build them is that when, I, when you build the nth decision tree, uh, you try to build it in such a way to get right the responses that the previous average of the trees have missed. So basically, you, and you do this by, by overweighting the examples that you missed. So basically, in each step, when you build an nth decision tree, you're going to take the previous weighted average, and you're going to weight the examples that previously, the previous, the previous situation missed. You're going to overweight them. And this is how you build more and more trees. Uh, and the gradient boosting, you definitely don't need to look at this, again, just for reference. So Here's um, this book that explained it, I think, the best. So basically, Friedman was the one that not only wrote this book, which is, I think, one of the best books on machine learning, especially from a statistical point of view, but uh, also invented the gradient boosting algorithm. So basically, you do, uh, you do this with uh, gradients. Most more, more importantly, uh, you would ask, how can I use this? So um, uh, I tried to find some solution that, that worked pretty well for what I needed for work a while ago. And I wanted to look at which open source tools I can use. And there was not really anything uh, uh, I could find with Google. so. I kind of started to compare these options, which are like R, Python packages, uh, XGBoost, Spark, and a few others. Um, so the first question is why open source? I'm sure I don't have to sell you guys. Open source, when I started doing this, uh, I stumbled upon this code from the then cargo number one, Owen Zhang. So they ask him how he wins all these Kaggle competitions. He develops his own algorithms. And basically, he was saying, no, then I just use open source implementations. And then I spend most of my time with feature engineering, which is a very sensible thing to do. So open source is free. It also has great community meetups, conferences, uh, documentation books, Stack Overflow, and then most people doing machine learning, data science, uh, with open source are using R or Python. And many of these algorithms have R and Python implementations. They are mostly implemented in C, C++, or Java. And then there is an R and Python package wrapper. So I did this benchmark, which I don't really consider it as like very complete, but it's more than whatever existed before, because there was no, not really anything comparing uh, any of these packages. So you can see it all on uh, GitHub. And it will have a lot of scale scaling graphs like this. Uh, for example, runtime uh, versus size. This is on a logarithmic scale and the number of records in millions. So 
from like 10,000 to 10 million records and what's the runtime between those and then what's the accuracy. So what's kind of surprising is that there is such a huge difference, even though everyone implements the algorithm in this book, basically. So you would think that everyone implements this, and still you would find uh, a lot of difference, even in accuracy, but yeah, even bigger in like runtime. So 10x, even 100x between the best and the worst implementations. So if one implementation runs for one minute and the other one for 100 minutes, then you probably want to use the faster one or one hour versus 100 hours. And the best ones, I'm going to spare you the time, are uh, XGBoost, uh, H2O, and now a n relatively newer package that's been open sourced by uh, Microsoft Lite GBM. And all of these have uh, R and Python uh, wrappers, so you can, if you use R or Python, you can install them in like under a minute and then start using it. Uh, the question is, well, this is a big data conference, so why not using Spark? So it's simple, simple, very slow. So unfortunately, Spark is like at least 10 times slower and uses 10 times more memory than uh, the best implementation. So it's literally slow. Uh, and this has been recognized by the Databricks team like many, many years ago. And I'm sure they tried to improve it. And indeed, with 2.0, so this was around 1.5 uh, when I did these benchmarks. And then by 2.0, uh, I really like the new data frame API. So instead of writing 100 lines of code, now you could do it in Spark with a few lines of code, just like with the, all the other packages. But unfortunately, it's, it got even slower than before. So, and also there are some accuracy problems. So I think it's kind of like an Ar architecture bug because all these big data algorithms, they try to do some approximations in order to to work on like big data and in a distributed fashion. So I think that the, there are still, and this hasn't improved since. So yeah, but I have big data, so uh, I need like a big data solution. So first, many of you, especially in like business projects, you don't really have big data, or if the data is big, is the raw data, let's say the clicks, but once you want to do user analytics, uh, you would have to feature engineer that, and you would get to a much more reduced and manageable and refined size. Uh, surveys say that a couple of million records, 100 million records is what covers I don't know, 95, 99% of use cases. So, and now that kind of fits in RAM. So when I started these benchmarks, basically the largest instance had already 250 gigs of RAM and you could buy 100 gigs of RAM into your uh, server very, for very cheap. And then since then we, we got much better and even bit bigger instances than this. And I also looked back as, at the last surveys on uh, the size of data for analytics. It seems like they've been growing at about 20% per year in the last decade, and RAM has been growing at least 50%. Uh, affordable, easily accessible RAM has grown at least 50% uh, uh, per year in the last decade. So. Uh, a lot more data now fits in the RAM of one server, so I always encourage people to use single server tools if those cut for machine learning applications. Uh, and here's a tweet from a while ago. I think by now everyone knows that for machine learning, you have to try first single machine tools. And unfortunately for machine learning, the big data tools are still kind of cumbersome, like th there are bugs, they are slow, 
and there are much, much less features. So I come from physics to finance and analytics, uh, and kind of like more sophisticated analytics. And uh, uh, on the other hand, most of the big data is mostly about processing SQL and some very simple, mathematically speaking, some simple transformations. And for machine learning, you need more of the sophisticated ones and not necessarily on the biggest data ever. And by now, most people have realized that, at least those working in machine learning, that basically what they want is uh, faster training and not these things to work with bigger data. Because you will see that gradient boosting is still very comp computational, very, very uh, demanding, and it it can run for a long time, so you you kind of want it to be faster. So I took this benchmark, which was not only for gradient boosting, but for random forest, even deep learning, neural nets, linear models, and I didn't really want it to maintain it, especially with Spark and any other tools that didn't really improve for many years. So. Uh, I made like a much leaner benchmark just for gradient boosting, just for the best tools, that I made it in a way that people can easier reproduce it. So basically there is a Docker file and you can just run it and then you can uh, run it on any hardware you want. So it's all on GitHub. So all you have to do is basically pretty much this. So these tools are pretty mature, so they kind of improved now incrementally, so this data from a year ago is not really very outdated. Um, so here you have runtime and accuracy on uh, a million and 10 million records. And most people are saying in the last few years that they work with 100,000 records, a million records, so this is uh, way enough for most use cases. So you can see that, um, so for many years, XGBoost was kind of the fastest, uh, but now LightGBM is kind of faster on CPUs, and uh, GPUs are like a big range because of deep learning. So for deep learning, it makes sense. With GPUs, you improve 100x on the speed, so no sane Fox would train uh, neural networks deep learning on CPUs because GPUs are so much faster. But for gradient boosting is different, so uh, you cannot parallelize it such easier. And basically, um, what you can parallelize is uh, the computation of so-called histograms, uh, but you can just gain so much, so it appears that uh, you don't get 100x. You, you are happy if you get a bit faster than on CPU. And uh, in this case, so XGBoost and LightGBM, they have completely different implementations from their CPU implementations. So for some reason, the XGBoost implementation is, right now is not only faster, but it's the one that's more stable and more feature-rich. And uh, this is what I and others are would recommend using it if you run it on the GPU. So you can see that the scaling is not linear also in neither of these cases. And it's, you kind of have to try it on your own data to see which one is, is best. Uh, and it's very easy to try. It's really just a couple of lines of code. So this is in R. The same would be in Python. Uh, you spend some uh, code here with trying to, so you have, in most business applications, you have categorical data and you have to transform them to numbers, one hot encoding or uh, something like that. And then the whole training is just this, it's really like one, two lines of code. And then uh, here's the predictions. So it's super easy to, to train and use a gradient boosting algorithm with any of these tools. Um, 
It's also very easy to deploy in production. So, uh, for example, you might ask, why did I put H2O here? Because I still kind of like it the best in the way that when you deploy it in a business application, is the tool that gives you the most. So uh, even though training is a bit slower, uh, still um, they provide you a tool with which you can, uh, with only this many lines of command line or code or whatever you call it, you already can export the model and uh, uh, incorporate it in a uh, RESTful API that runs on Jetty servers, and you can scale it and uh, make requests for scoring. So it's literally just that. So back to training, gradient boosting has a lot of hyperparameters. Some of the most important ones are the number of trees. I was explaining that we are averaging trees. Typically, you want a few hundred depths of the trees, how deep they are. Typically, you want, I don't know, 10 or between 5 and 50, maybe. Uh, and then there is something called learning rate, which is similar to stochastic gradient descent, that it will prevent a tree to get too, uh, too high weight. Um, and then there, are, there is something called uh, early stopping. I think, yeah, the next slide would explain. So one problem with gradient boosting, in a way similar to neural nets, if you train them too much, they're going to overfit. Uh, so if you just check the accuracy on your training set, it will look like if it goes up, so you would want to train more and more. But if you really check the accuracy on um, validation, holdout, or test set, then you would see that it increases. And then after that, uh, when it starts overfitting, uh, the accuracy on a, this independent holdout set will decrease. So early stopping would help you stop here. And basically, all the three uh, um, implementations, they you just give it uh, a few parameters and it will do early stopping. So this has been implemented later than when I started the benchmarks, but, but now all the best tools, they have it. You can spend a lot of time uh, uh, learning how to tune manually. Uh, here are two blog posts you can check for reference. And ultimately, it goes down to this figure from my the favorite book I, I quoted, the Hasty Shrani book, that basically you would try to find an optimal model complexity. So a too complex model would be great on a training set, but it will overfit and it will not give you optimal performance on a separate test set or in a practical application. Like a simple model, such like maybe a linear model in this kind of when a more sophisticated one would be better, would be here, so it would underfit. Um, so how do we do this tuning? There are several ways. You can do so-called manual search when you try different values based on kind of your knowledge. You can do a uh, grid search by combining all these param hyperparameters. So exam for example, number of trees, also uh, depths of the trees. Uh, but the literature suggests that random search, when you poke random numbers in this hyperparameter space, is computationally more efficient than uh, grid search. So look at this paper. Uh, this would explain you why you want to do random search. And there is also something called uh, uh, student gradient descent when you give it to your students to tune the hyperparameters <laughs> and do the work. Um, I've been playing with tuning and random search in this GitHub repo. You can uh, uh, check it out. Uh, Another thing I want to mention is the scaling of those, of these algorithms uh, and implementations uh, to multi-core is not trivial. So 
kind of ironically at this conference, I was expressing my views against distributed computing for machine learning. But because, so basically all these implementations now they have, they, they also have the distributed version. But in this case, uh, between the nodes, you have to exchange so much information on the network that sometimes it slows down. So even for a million, 10 million records, you might get slow, slower training on five or 10 nodes than on one single node. But even worse, what never, never nobody expected uh, is that you can get this even on a single machine if you have multiple CPU sockets. So uh, many of these Amazon instances and powerful servers have now, uh, I don't know, 128 cores, but they are not on one CPU die. They are on like two or dual socket or four quad socket. And each of the CPU socket ha is connected on a fast bus to its own uh, memory bank. But when one CPU has to access the data on an in RAM, uh, which is it happens to be on another memory bank, this will create uh, uh, slowdowns. So uh, you could see here with any special XGBoost and LightGB, I'm, I'm prone to this. So you would see here, the, this is the runtime, depending on which cores on the CPU I'm using, and I, I'm pinning them to different cores. So with four cores, you get this runtime. With eight cores, you get this runtime. But if you pin it to cores on different CPUs, then you would have the slowdown from eight here to eight here on two s CPU cores. Also, like if you use uh, hyper-threading, it will also create this kind of slowdown. So you would get this. With 16 cores, you would get kind of... So this, this was an um, instance with four sockets, each one having 16 real cores and another 16 uh, uh, hyper-threaded. So 32 times 4, 128 cores the x1 32 extra large so and then if you run it on even more cores you get even slower and the 128 cores that couldn't fit in this graph so it was like five times slower on 128 cores than on 16 cores so sometimes you see people bragging that here is i use 64 cores, 128 cores for training my machine learning team. Guess what? It might be slower than on 16 cores. So you kind of have to try it for yourself. A uh, couple of months ago, these guys have opened a GitHub issue and they're trying to work on making things better. But it's really hard to make uh, this algorithm it's basically socket and NUMA aware. Um, so, uh, basically, this is another graph that kind of shows you that, well, what's the process of doing a machine learning project, that do we do the feature engineering, training, tuning, and evaluation the model, and then we do the deployment. Um, and most of the time I was speaking here about uh, just the modeling and which algorithm and how we can choose the fastest one and the most accurate. But many of these other things are also important. So if you score, you can score in batch or real time. For real time, uh, uh, I was saying already that H2 is probably what you want because it has kind of the uh, tools that make deployment into real time scoring uh, the easiest. And here it would be some kind of brief comparison of what I think are the best three options. And I made this for an R conference before, so I included kind of like the default uh, gradient boosting implementation in R, which is very outdated and nobody maintains it. But it's still probably the first thing you would stumble upon if you look for gradient boosting in R. Well, don't use that package. Use any of this three and 
I was kind of saying already that basically if you want the, s the fastest implementation on CPU, then uh, then use uh, uh, light GBM, right? If you have a GPU, then uh, try to use XGBoost. And then if you care about fast real-time scoring, then uh, use HTO. So again, you have three tools, and depending on your uh, use case and many others, uh, things you, you want to use uh, one or the other. And then about a year ago, I asked uh, people on Twitter uh, what implementations are they using. And XGBoost is so popular because it has been used a lot in Kaggles, and LightGBM is a newer one. But now I think LightGBM use is also raising, and I think still more people you do Kaggles and use this gradient boosting for more like homebrew projects and not necessary production. So that's why H2O is kind of so low. So, and you can see that nobody really uses Spark. By this time, everyone has figured out that uh, you kind of want all the others. And even the Spark people, they're trying now to wrap the other packages uh, into Spark. And then CPU versus GPU. So yeah, not s a lot of people have GPUs, and uh, GPUs don't offer this kind of 10 or 100x advantage, like for deep learning. Uh, and then uh, what kind of algos people are using in practice. So I'm not surprised, probably most of my followers, they work on real business applications in industry. So they use a lot of random forest grading boosting and less the uh, neural nets. And I have a lot more repos related to uh, gradient boosting. Uh, I think the slides will be available, or just contact me if you cannot find them, and then I will be happy to send them to you. So I guess this is it, and then we we'll probably have a few minutes for our questions. Thank you. Yes, question? Do we have a mic for the questions? Or? Oh, OK. Um, so I come from an academia yeah. background. So I was wondering if in, in this uh, realm there is any interesting algorithm coming from high performance computing, any interesting advance that might, because they usually you know they think about, like, they develop distributed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah excellent uh, question. So I think all the three uh, best implementations, they are the best because they've been done by people with a HPC background. So uh, uh, and that's why the, the other one is, is not, because the other one has been approached by more like this kind of big data crunching kind of background. So basically, the optimizations that are put in this are literally, it comes down to how you read the data from RAM so that you can uh, keep it in the registers as much as possible, and you can take, uh, take advantage of cache locality and those kind of things. So basically, the algorithms have been already in, um, in, uh, optimized. There is also like. All this are using like columnar storage for uh, kind of opt an, as another way of optimizing. So, I, so basically, the 10x speed, which is quite huge, so it's not like 10%, but it's like 10x, comes from this kind of knowing really what's going on uh, in that processor. And people doing this have all uh, background in HPC. All right, thank you so much. I guess we're done.